Hello, welcome to my mission design workshop. This is going to be the first session. In this session, we're going to look at uh, the basics of the mission editor. That this workshop series is designed for Black Shark Den members. However, uh, you definitely can take what you learn in this workshop for making your own missions if you're not part of the squadron. If you haven't heard of Black Shark Den, just check us out blacksharkden.com. Link in the description below there. Anyways, without further ado, let's uh, let's get started on this workshop. I'll be going along in real time with this and give a little bit of time doing things more slowly, which should allow, uh, allow you guys to keep up. Okay, so let's start out by entering our mission editor here. So you're going to be presented with either opening a mission or creating a new one. So we're going to create a new mission. Here you'll be able to select all of your uh, terrains or the coalitions who's on which side. So for the terrain, right now you can see I have four. I've got the Caucasus, Marianas, the Persian Gulf, and Syria. For this uh video I'm going to do the Caucasus. So in here in the coalitions you can select whoever you want on which side. Let's say we want Lebanon on the blues and then Mexico on the reds. You can move them over there and then that will put that country on that side for your mission. This I'm just going to set it to modern which is the default set for everybody. And that should give us the US on the blue and actually you know, we're going to put the insurgents here. For this, let, let's put the insurgents on the red side. We'll be fighting them. So we'll put the insurgents on the red and that should keep them uh, give them to be a, an enemy for us. So hit OK and it's going to start uh, loading up to your mission. Mission editor. So here we have the mission editor main screen. You've got your entire map. If you right click, you can pan around, look around the map as much as you want, as much as visible that the map allows you to see. Use your scroll wheel to zoom out, zoom in, and just a couple more tricks here. If you want to measure the distance between something, so let's say what's the difference between Kutaisi and Seneki, I'm going to hold my middle mouse button down and I'm going to drag. That'll give me a ruler measurement uh, <clears throat> that shows me 19 miles at heading 275. If I want that ruler to stay, then I'll go down to the bottom, uh, the, the left side bar here. I'll click on the Use Ruler button. Then this time I can not use a ruler apparently. There we go. I can left click and that leaves me with my ruler measurement on the screen. If I click off of that ruler or if I click that ruler button again, then it, it removes my ruler for me. I can also change the way that units look. So let's say we got a uh, an Abrams, and say so there's a Russian BMP three. I've got them set to uh, Russian right now, but I can change it to NATO icons. She's going to give me that. Uh, oh, hang on a sec here. So you got the the classic NATO icons with the shapes. Um, however, with these NATO icons, as you know, there is no shape to them. It's kind of hard to see where they're pointing. So 
let's say I got a K50, and then Yui. I mean, these two, you can't tell which way they're pointing. If they haven't, like, take off from ground, you can't see it unless I zoom all the way in. Then you can see the model of it. But otherwise, even including these these ground vehicles, you can't see what direction that they're pointing unless you zoom all the way in. Please note, um, in order to see the models when you zoom in, at the bottom bar here, you'll see a button called Show Models. You just got to make sure that that's turned on. So if I switch to Russian icons and I click on these to update them, then you can see that they are now pointing in the direction that I've pointed them in. And this just makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to uh, see the units on the battlefield from afar. You can also change your units to metric if you want to measure in kilometers rather than in miles. Do that. And that will also give you altitudes and speeds in miles and kilometers. I'm going to switch to material, uh, Imperial and Russian icons for this. If you need to delete something, just hit the delete button and uh, that get, gets rid of it. Just note that there is no undo button in the mission editor. You can't undo a delete or any sort of action that you've done. One more little pro tip, bottom or two more tips actually. At the bottom, you have your waypoints. Right now mine is set to MGRS. If I hit Alt Y, then I can change the uh, the coordinate types. So right at MGRS, I can change it to the base coordinates that the game itself uses if you're doing any heavy scripting. I can change it to a lat long, a uh, few different types of lat longs. And back to MGRS. If I hit Control Y, then that brings up the coordinates of where my mouse is. So let's say I've got my mouse over top of Naki here. I hit Control Y, then I get the, uh, the game coordinates, the lat longs, and the MGRS, and I also get the altitude and the feet that that point is at. So let's say you have friendlies in an area and you, you don't have a map available, you want people to find out where the, the friendlies are simply through a coordinate. Say they're in this river here, or near this river. Just hit control Y and then I can copy this entire grid. It's a lot easier than trying to write things down uh, by looking at the bottom left of your screen. You can also change the way the map looks. Uh, you can change it to satellite, which is going to give you like a top-down view with some textures on it. You can change it to the map, which is going to give you that real-life kind of uh, VFR map look to it, which is kind of interesting for creating briefings and such. Um, in the alt view, if I click on this little key right above the ruler here, I can change different settings. I have the geographical grid on. I can turn off the MGRS if I don't want it to be looking at it when I'm zoomed in like this. Uh, I can disable my airfields. If I don't like the buildings, I can get rid of those. Uh, I'm not sure what the drawings one does. The electrical power lines, if you need to get rid of those. Forests, if uh, say I'm looking here, everything's just a little too green. I want to see the relief of the map a little bit better. I can click on the forests and then that gives me much better relief view. Um, you got railways, some rivers, turn off your roads if you want, towns, 
This one's a little bit handy if you're, uh, as well, looking at the, uh, the relief. So, say we're in Tikapuli, and, uh, I can't really see the relief under here, what, what's on a hill, what's not. I turn off the towns, there I can see all the, all the contour lines. And user objects. This one's a little bit handy, like if you built a really cool looking farp. And, uh, that's not a farp. If you've built a really cool looking farp, uh, with lots of objects on it. And, uh, but you don't want to be looking at the the icons that are going to be cluttering up your screen. You want to take a screenshot maybe, uh, like a top-down view of your farp for people to see in a briefing. Um, these icons can make it look a little cluttered when you get lots of objects in there. So you just click off user objects. You can still see your models, and uh, but the, the display for the objects is gone. This also works for zones. If you've got a few trigger zones kicking around and you want to hide them quickly to take a, a screenshot or, or a, a picture for your briefing, you can just turn off that user objects and it gets rid of those two. So that pretty much covers the basic uses of the editor. Moving around, getting around, placing the objects, turning them Deleting them. Um, so let's start off with actually creating a mission. So the first thing you got to do when you're making up a mission is figure out what the goal is. What what are you doing? What's the whole mission about? So this could be you are doing an assault, or this uh, there's a pr I like I like to break it down into a a problem or a solution, uh, or and a solution. So the problem is you've got base or a outpost or stronghold of some sort that the enemy holds, and they've got a whole bunch of armaments that you don't think that they need. So what's the solution? Well, we're going to go blow it up. Then you can build your mission off of going to blow up a stronghold. Uh, so for this exercise or workshop, you can make whatever problem and solution you feel like. As long as it's not too complicated and you can kind of keep up. Um, I'm going to keep mine simple. It's going to be a hot extraction. So I'm going to have some friendly troops that are, are out on a patrol. And uh, they got into some shit. Now they're pinned in a town. And they need uh, extraction from a lift helicopter. With some fire support. So what's my solution to that problem? Well, the lift helicopter is going to come. Gonna go suppress the enemy with that that onboard fire support, extract the troops, and then bring them back home. Okay, so we got a problem, we got a solution. Now we just gotta find an area where we want to do it. So I like the Kataisi area. Lots of hills, mountains, forests, lakes, stuff around here. It's just a really uh, lovely place to fly around in. And uh, I also like the, the heliport that's in the town of Kataisi. So let's put our, let's find out where we want the, the climax area to be. This is where all the action is going to take place. So it'll be where, where the enemy has captured or has pinned our friendlies in this situation. So I'm going to look for, in LZ, a place to put my, my troops. I think in this town will be pretty good. Um, oh, you know what? We're going to fix this bug right now. You guys see this? There's, uh, you see these, these trees? But as I zoom in, the trees disappear. This is a really easy fix. Just quickly run your mission. Don't worry about uh, saving it unless you've done some work to it. You're going to load it up. And then we're going to hit quit. Now we've got our forests and they're not disappearing. So I can actually find my LZ now. And let's see, 600 feet. I think this will be big enough for an LZ. 
we're gonna land our we're gonna put our friendlies in this area so what I'm gonna do to help organize my AO find out what I want to what where I want to put my stuff I'm gonna use my trigger zones Here, there's gonna be kind of like drawings markers on the ground and uh Let's just set it to a thousand feet or so. So I got my friendlies here. Maybe I want enemies in other areas of this town. So let's take a look at the uh, the relief. Actually, that's a pretty high slope. Maybe I need to move that LZ. Yeah, this is a good example of why you need to disable towns sometimes. So we'll put our friendlies here. Say they're pinned down by the river. We can put an enemy here, maybe. one up the hill and why don't we put another one over here now we've got some enemy area forces that I want to uh, to place around there now I just got to figure out where I'm going to start my helicopters from so I said I like this heli base so this is where I'm going to have my uh, my helicopter starting from. And last, I got to figure out how the helicopter is going to get there. So we'll plot a quick little route. We'll say they're going to follow, head to Kataisi out to the second river, and then they can follow that second river. This could be waypoint one. That green. Actually, we'll make the river start point waypoint one. Then we'll make the forks waypoint two. And the last final stretch can be release point one. We've got our route plotted. We're gonna follow this river up to where the friendlies are pinned. Okay, so we've got our mission goal to get the friendlies out of the bad guys area and bring them back to Kataisi. So let's first place some enemy units around here. So I'm going to click on this little tank, the ground units option. I'm going to go to insurgents. I'm going to pick some infantry. And... Infantry uh, Insurgent AK-74. Let's put uh, you guys down here. So as I place them down, you can see that it places just one uh, soldier down. I can rotate them around with this little pointer wheel here um, to have them face whatever heading I want them to be at. If I click on the ammo section, I can look at different skins that I have for him. Um, if you guys have extra skins installed, these might be a mod. Um, but the default one is not. Uh, so we're going to just stick, leave it the default skin here. And then there's two ways to add more. You can either click on this arrow, which uh, creates another copy of this unit in sequence behind him or I can hit the plus button here which uh, creates a copy of the or moves this unit down by one in a sequence or up by one in the sequence and adds a copy in its position so say this um, just have this anti here to ATGM launcher here. 
Um, if I have this infantry and I want to add an infantry man in front of the ATGM launcher, then I will hit the plus button. Um, which adds him to the front. If I want this infantry to be behind the ATGM launcher, then I'll hit the arrow, which puts him back here. If I want to remove some units, then I can either remove the last unit by uh, reducing that 6 to a 5, or I can remove a specific unit by selecting that unit and hitting the minus button. One more thing, um, this comes really handy when you're placing some nearby ground units. If you see I hit the arrow beside the one there, it adds him pretty far back. But if I hit the plus button, then he's a little bit closer. So we're going to have, let's say, six insurgents, five insurgents standing around here. So I'm going to duplicate it five times. I'm going to scatter them around. They're just kind of hanging out by these trees. Having some coffee. Uh, if you run into a problem like this where you want to move the first unit of a group, you hit the control. And while you're holding control on your keyboard, you can move number one around. And we're going to name these guys just in case. So we're doing so many triggers. It'll make it a whole heck of a lot easier for us to do the triggers if we name them. So we're going to name them Insurgents. And if I add a dash one, then that helps the mission editor um, number these units better when I copy it. And you'll see that right away here. So I do Insurgents dash one. If I sel select the group here, hit Control C to copy them. And then I want to put some more of them over here. Then I hit Control V. That'll place them. I'll paste them in place here, and you can see that they're now named Insurgents 2. So that's how the mission editor names enemy forces in the in the sim uh, in sequence there. So generally, using dash after your um, unit name is going to give you that that sequencing. Okay, these guys are hanging out on the roof of this building. So switch to sat. Oh, no, that's not a flat roof. Uh, nah. Oh, they can hang out on that roof there. Whatever. I don't know if it's a flat roof or not, but they could be, uh, maybe they're redoing tiles with their AK-74s or redoing the, the metal paneling up there. And the AK-74s are uh, really fancy nail guns. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Okay. So it didn't exactly stick to my plan, but it's close enough don't have to stick to your plan, it's, it's your mission, you do whatever you want with it. So now we have some enemy troops on the ground that are going to be our, uh, <clears throat> our enemy force in this mission. Um, quick little tip here, if you need to select more than one unit at a time, uh, say you need to delete a bunch or copy a whole bunch of, of groups, um, you select one group, hold shift, and then uh, you can select more groups after that. Just be careful you don't click off the side, otherwise it'll, if you miss, then uh, it'll deselect all those units. Okay, so let's place our friendlies. Now these ones are a little bit trickier because we want to make sure that they are CTLD compatible. But CTLD is 
the troop transports logistics uh, system that lift helicopters can use to load and unload infantry and cargo. So to do this, we're going to use one of the CTLD unit names. And by default, this is extract one. Extract one. And uh, I believe by default, this goes up to 10. So you can have up to 10 different extract groups. We're just going to pick our infantry with M4s and we're going to put them down here. Same way, maybe we'll give them some multicam. Uh, it's the same as the enemy infantry though for creating more. And I believe this was just added in a new patch. If you create more troops they keep the same skin that you've picked so these guys all have multicam if i add more or less then they all keep that multicam so the huey is our helicopter that we're going to be using today so the huey is only able to hold eight infantry i'm going to have a full group of eight infantry on the ground here waiting to go because they are sad they got stuck in this town and they just want to go home and have some coffee oh well, you know what let's let's put them in a more defensive position they look like they're just waiting to get shot up here so let's uh let's give them a little bit more interesting uh we'll have them taking cover in some of these buildings here taking point watching watching their their angles I'm not sure on ground infantry tactics and how they take cover around buildings, but I imagine it goes something along the lines of get behind the building and watch for the bad guys, you know? Sometimes this, uh, this control option does not work. Yeah, it's not working. I can't move him by himself right now. Couple bugs in this mission editor sometimes still, so you gotta watch out for them. And one of them is I can't always get the control button to work when I wanna move just the group leader. Okay, so here we have our extract group. They're sitting up in a building, ready to go. So we have our action area all set up this is our AO now let's move over to our starting point so let's have a helicopter start point now I could just take this helicopter button over to the UH-1 put it down hit take off from ground and call it a day but that would be a pretty boring starting place to go to. So instead, I'm going to give him a helipad. Now, by default, I believe there's only a couple uh, FARP helipads. But if you can get to... Um, Get some modded ones. There's a, a couple really good helipad objects out there. You can find concrete, grass, uh, Marston mats. Oh, I believe this is a, uh, a default pad, but this one sticks up from the ground quite a bit, so I don't like to use it personally. Um, you can use this one if you want to for... Here, I'll, I'll pull this one up. We'll, we'll use this, this sad uh, tall one as our, our starting pad. We're gonna center the helicopter on it. Uh, you can do takeoff from parking or takeoff from ramp and it will center on that pad. However, there is a bug right now where the helicopters spawn under the pad and explode. So we're gonna pick takeoff from ground for now. Now, 
if I leave the skill to veteran, that leaves this helicopter as an AI, and it's going to take off all by itself, and the player's not going to be able to fly it. So because this is a single player mission, I'm going to select player. However, if this was a multiplayer situation, you're going to want to select client. So I'm selecting player for this one. And then I want to set the way the helicopter looks. So the first tab here is the payload tab. That's going to give me my helicopter. I'm going to pick the Black Shark Den Olive Drab skin because this is a Black Shark Den video and our squadron is just awesome. So we've got the Black Shark Den Outlaw Olive Drab livery here. I want some miniguns on the doors, so I select minigun payload. If I wanted a, uh, a custom payload, I could either change this one or I can create a new payload. And I can change, say, M60s on the doors. And if I want some miniguns on the front. And why don't we add some 7 Hydras and Tachis on the side just because it's a Huey and we can do that. So that's another way to uh, update and create new payloads. But for this mission, I just want to use the, the miniguns on the doors. They're kind of heavy here. Troops are going to be eight, uh, 100 kilograms each or 220 pounds each. So a fully loaded helicopter of troops is, um, I believe, 1,760 pounds. So that's going to actually put me overweight here, as I'm only about 550 pounds, give or take, within max weight here. I'm going to cut my fuel back to about 60%. Still going to be pretty close to that maximum weight, but I'll just have to remember to not do a performance ta max performance takeoff on my departure. Um, mission planning, performance planning, all that stuff is going to help you with uh, determining how much fuel you need in your helicopters and the flight leads of that group should be able to make that plan. However, for this um, workshop, I'm just going to quickly set it to 60% fuel. I can make triggered actions in this helicopter if I wanted to. This is a little bit more advanced stuff, not going to go over it today. Um, the summary is useful for AI, seeing the route time length, how fast they're going to fly. Failures, if you want to add some failures. I'm not sure. I don't think these work in multiplayer. Could be wrong. Um, could be fixed by the time you watch this video. Who knows? Uh, we don't really use failures at Black Shark Den anyways. I can change the radio preset. So uh, our standard radio on Black Shark Den is 251 on the UHF. I'm going to pick that one. And then I can change a couple extra options in this. the three dots up here. I can change, remove the IR suppressor so now the, the toilet seat's gone. Or I can put it back on and keep the IR protected. I can change the skill of the gunners. Usually I leave this at 90%, um, but 100% will uh, increase that ability. Uh, or decreasing it, sometimes they don't even shoot at the targets. You can also change the, the condition of the engine. So the lower the percentage of the engine resource, the higher chance it's going to burn out when you're doing that maximum performance. Leave that up max as well. If you want to get rid of the co-pilot uh, or the left hand seat, you can hit solo flight. Please note that this disables multi-crew. And then in terms of multi-crew, the aircraft control priority, usually at Black Shark Den we set it to equally responsible. What this does is this prevents one person from taking controls from another. Um, without the other granting permission through a, a confirmation message. So say you have a training helicopter and you want the pilot to be able to uh, 
uh, or the co-pilot to be able to take control from the pilot if something is going wrong, but the pilot needs to ask permission to take it back, then you can set it to co-pilot. You can set it to ask always, which is going to have both parties always confirm when requesting control. Or you can set it to equally responsible, which means one pilot can immediately take control from the other and vice versa. Usually at Black Shark Den, we like to leave it at equally responsible, especially in the case of uh, if somebody need, sees something coming and they need to take control immediately to take evasive action without uh, warning. But uh, generally, you want to try to communicate that first. Uh, if you need the helicopter to be running hot, you can set it to take up, take off from ground hot. However, we're just going to be taking off from a cold start. Uh, actually, you know what? When you're doing mission testing, you don't want to be messing around with a cold start. So we're going to leave it at hot for now. But uh, when we want this mission out, if we're going to send it to some people to fly or run it on Black Shark Den for others to fly in a group, we want to make sure we turn those helicopters to cold if that's the intent for everyone to start cold. But I'll set it to hot for now, just so that I can get up in the air faster when I'm testing my mission. Last, we're going to give this group a name. This is the name that people are going to see when they uh, get into the, the helicopter list. So we'll give it the aircraft name, or the, the platoon, Outlaw 1. Okay, so now we have our starting position with the helicopter sitting on a pad. Maybe we'll decorate this far up a little bit, so I'm going to go back to the static objects, that little bridge here. I'm going to scroll to structures, which is going to give me all my different buildings and such I can pick from. Maybe, uh, maybe I want a garage sitting there beside it. A couple garages. I'll put a windsock nearby. See the winds. This doesn't need to face in any particular direction. It'll automatically turn with the wind. So I can set it to zero if I want, and it'll turn with the wind. And why don't we just put a watchtower here too? Just for fun. One more thing that I need to have this FARP operational is some vehicles. So for a FARP to be operational, it must have um, a heliport. So it could be a single helipad, it could be invisible. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. It could be invisible, where there's no object whatsoever. Um, but it's, it still works as a FARP could just be a the big FARP object, uh, or in our case, just a single pad here. So you need a heliport, and you need three vehicles. So we're going to go to unarmed, or, or ground vehicle here. We're going to go to uh, is it Humvee. We're going to add someone to that group. We're going to pick the refueler. And we're going to pick the M939 heavy truck. So these three vehicles are required for a fully functional FARP. If you're missing the truck, helicopters can't rearm and repair. If you're missing the refueler, the helicopters can't refuel. And if you're missing the Humvee, then I believe that you can't even contact the ground crew because the Humvee is used for the communications. Make sure our FARP group is here. We're going to name them whatever we want. 
and I'm going to call them FARP dudes. And here we go, we now have a fully functional FARP. I can get rid of this. Okay, so now we have our starting point. We've got our root, we've got our friendlies that we need to get, we've got our baddies. Now we need to set up the the backbone of the mission. So these are the scripts. Now if you're using a Black Shark Den template, you don't need to do this part because all these scripts should be already set up. However, I'm going to show you guys how to set the scripts up anyways. So you're going to hit new. This is going to create a once trigger. Tr once trigger. This is going to occur only once in the mission. If the the conditions are met multiple times during the mission, then uh, it will not trigger a second time. So we're going to call this one missed. This is our basic scripting environment. We're going to say time more one second. We're going to hit new action. Do script file. We're going to hit open. And um, we're going to go to our starting kit. If you didn't download the starting kit yet, the link is in the description. So we're going to open our starting kit, go to scripts, and we're going to select mist 4490. We're going to copy this. We're going to go make our CSAR script. We're going to add a second to that timer, so it's two seconds now. And then we're going to pick uh, CSAR. Make a copy of that. I'm going to call it CTLD. Add another second to that timer. And we'll select the CTLD script. Oh, you know what? I forgot one thing. Um, so we're going to change our CSAR and CTLD to 3 and 4 seconds, respectively. And this, uh, this duplicate CSAR that I just cloned here. We're going to name it Moose, and we're going to select oops, uh, the Moose script. So what Moose is, is this is a, a scripting environment that CSAR and CTLD rely on. Now it's very important that you load these scripts in this order, um, at least Mist and Moose. CSAR and CTLD can be loaded in any order and they both will work fine. But MIST needs to be loaded first. This is the basic DCS scripting environment. Moose is the uh, is a more plug-in user-friendly um, scripting tool set that almost all scripts in DCS rely on. So these are these are the four scripts that we need for all BSD missions. Any additional scripts? Say we want to add the game master script. This is a great script. Really helps out when uh, running missions. Um, we'll go over the game master options and controls in another video, though. Okay. Now let's say we want to have uh, some triggers occur when when we get to this area. So I've got some friendlies on the ground here. I want them to pop smoke on that area when a helicopter gets near it. So let's say I want them to pop smoke at about uh, right around this curve here. So we're looking at about 1.4 miles. I believe that's going to be approximately, no, yeah, roughly 9,000 feet. We'll set that friendly zone to 9,000 feet. So how do I make smoke come out of the trigger? Well, I'm going to do a once trigger again. Then I'm going to name it Smoke Friendlies. 
of the condition. So this is what's going to activate the trigger. I want it to activate when helicopters enter that friendly zone, specifically blue helicopters. So I could say all of group in zone or all of coalition in zone, but if I do all of coalition in zone, then that means that the, the, the blue guys that are currently on the ground are going to trigger it. So that's not something that I want to use. All of group in zone may work if you have only one helicopter. However, if you have five or six helicopters that could be triggering this, then that could be a little extra work for you. So the quickest way to do this is pick part of coalition in zone. We're going to say blue, friendlies, and then the unit type, we're going to pick helicopter. So that means that this trigger is only going to activate when a blue helicopter enters the zone. Now what's going to happen? Well, let's let's put some smoke on the zone. So I'm going to do smoke marker, friendlies, we'll say leave the altitude at 1, make the, the smoke red. Now I want to have a message come up when this happens so that the helicopter can see that there is a smoke marker that was placed there and they're not just wondering where is this red smoke coming from. So we're going to say message to all. Uh, if you have a PvP scenario and you have red uh, versus blue players, you might want to do message to coalition, group, or country. However, if everybody's on the same team and you want everybody to hear this message, you can just pick message to all. It makes it a whole heck of a lot easier to set up. So we're going to do message to all and say red smoke popped on friendlies. Get us the heck out of here. Ten seconds might be a little bit short. Twenty seconds seems to be a pretty sweet spot for uh, short messages like this, especially if somebody's a little focused on something, they can't look at the message right away. Gives them a little time to look at it. We'll give it a five second delay just to simulate that they've thrown the smoke, the smoke is going, and then they send the message. Now I want to make a sound as well. So I'm going to play same thing as message to all. I'm going to do sound to all. Open that, open the starting kit. I'm just going to grab one of the squilch sounds here. You can listen to it as a preview. Perfect. I'm going to open that one. We're also going to give it a five second delay so that it plays at the same time as the message that I sent. The next trigger I want to make here um, I want my waypoints and my release point to show up on the screen. So I'm going to do an, a new once trigger. We're going to say, call it waypoints. We're going to leave the conditions blank. That means this trigger is going to trigger immediately. And we're going to do 
Mark to all. Now marks have unique IDs and you cannot have more than one mark with the same ID. So the value here needs to be changed for every mark. So the first mark, waypoint one, we're gonna name it WP1 and hit the WP1 zone on the map here. If I don't want my, peop my uh, pilots to be able to delete the zone, I'm gonna set it to read only and that prevents the zone from being deletable. I'm gonna clone this change the value to 2, change the name to WP2, change the zone to waypoint 2, and clone it again, change the value to 3, set the name to RP1, and we'll set the zone to RP1. Now what this is going to do is at the start of the mission it's going to place markers on the F10 map with the words WP1, WP2, and RP1 on the maps. And because they're read-only, then the pilot cannot accidentally delete them. Now I want to make a win condition. This is going to be a nice little message that makes your players feel good that they've accomplished something today. We're going to do the... Uh, once the helicopter and all the friendlies are outside of this, this AO area, then there's going to be a little jingle played for them. So we're going to say win. I'm going to change the color of it to green just for more organization's sake. Maybe I'll change the smoke friendlies to blue and the waypoints to, uh, to blue as well. Now this win condition... Um, oh, I must have cloned it as a habit, sorry. Uh, this win condition I is pretty basic. I mentioned uh, the all of coalition in zone for the smoke. You can use this for out of zone as well. So once the helicopter enters this zone, it's considered coalition in the zone. So when the helicopter picks up the friendlies, the condition still sees the helicopter inside the zone and says, no, we're not ready yet. So it's not until the friendlies and the helicopter have left this zone that the condition is met. Maybe I also want to make sure that the helicopter is still alive and didn't get blown up while it's in the zone. So I would make unit alive and pick my helicopter, which is named Rotary 1 in this case. Uh, so we'll set an auto coalition of zone, uh, or a call coalition out of zone. We're going to set the coalition to blue and the zone to friendlies. Once all that coalition is out of the zone and the helicopter is still alive, then we'll have our little win message play. We're going to say message to all mission win set it to 20 seconds and I'm going to create a copy of that I'm going to say all of friendlies or have been extracted and are clear of the hot area. And then say good job. So why did I duplicate these instead of just writing them all in the same box? Well this just makes it look a little bit nicer by separating these messages into their own separate boxes which are going to display at the same time. Just a kind of nicer way to organize your uh, your messages on screen. By all means you can absolutely write this in the same message box as well. And last, the best part, is I'm going to play my jingle. So we're going to go to the starting kit, go to the sounds, and we're going to hit success plus good job. Job. Just like that. Um, if you want to end the mission via this wind, or via this win, you can also add a end mission option here. Uh, however, generally like to let the the player end their own mission if they like to RTB. And in a multiplayer situation, you probably should not end the mission unless uh, you have a special reason to do so. 
Okay, so just a recap here. We've got our helicopter starting here at Kataisi. Its payload is ready to go. We've got guns on the side. We've got fuel on board. It's set to be a player helicopter. It's set to start from the ground hot. I've got my route plotted out. And I've got triggers for the route set up. I've got enemies placed on the ground ready to go. I've got friendlies placed on the ground ready to be extracted. And I've got a smoke marker so that when a helicopter enters this friendly zone, it's going to pop a smoke marker on them. And I've got my win condition to say when everybody's out of the zone, the mission is won and the messages to go along with it. So this mission is pretty much ready to go now. We've just got a few more things left to do before we can get started on it. So on the left side here, we've got a few options. We have create mission briefing. You can add a little bit of information about your mission here. The sortie would probably be the mission name. So let's say trouble in the valley is the mission name or the sortie name. Situation, uh, friendlies on a patrol in, the heck is the name of that town? Something Nori, it's like Nori, uh, maybe, I'm not good at pronouncing Georgian names. Friendlies on a patrol in this town have come in contact with insurgents and are now pinned with no escape. Got no reds, so the blue task is take a UH-1 from Kataisi Heliport and provide fire support for the friendlies. Once it is safe to do so, extract the friendlies using CTLD and bring them back to Kutaisi. <clears throat> you want to add a picture? Go ahead and do that. Um, if you have pictures kicking around, let's say uh, I'm just going to pick up a Black Shark Den logo here. Uh, that's not the Black Shark Den logo. Uh, I'll pick our outlaw one. The outlaw picture. <clears throat> and then next we're going to do the environment. So we're going to go to the date, time, and weather. Let's say, let's just put it today, the 22nd of July 2021. Say so our mission time is 2 in the afternoon. Uh, you know what, let's put it at 5 in the afternoon. Make the sun nice and low, or a little bit lower. I can pick different presets of clouds, or I can create my own cloud settings of the base, thickness, density, but I like the presets a lot more. They look a whole lot nicer. So we're going to pick uh, scattered three. Just leave it at 8,000 feet. Maybe we'll set the Q and H to nine or seven five. We'll have the winds coming out of east these winds are blowing at let's give it uh, about five knots I was gonna set my higher altitude winds at double by default change the heading a little bit set it to 16 knots at 6600 and then the very high altitude winds will be about 48 knots heading to the coming from the west. 
Put a little bit of turbulence in there. We'll leave the fog and dust out. And that should be, oh, well, let's give the weather, let's make it a little bit warmer out. We'll give it 26 degrees Celsius out there. Okay, we've got our environment set up. Now I want to set a couple extra settings here. Generally, especially in a multiplayer situation, maybe not so much a single player mission, but in a multiplayer mission, you want to have a game master just in case something goes wrong and you need to jump in for combined arms or see what's going on. Game master is definitely recommended for a multiplayer mission if you're with a, a group that's trusted to have the game master slot. If you have combined arms and you want to be able to control a vehicle while flying it, you want to check this box. Otherwise, leave it blank. We'll go down to set mission options now. It, this is where you're going to be able to restrict the the things that pilots can do in the mission. Um, if you uh, check off the box on the, the left here, then that means you're enforcing it, overriding whatever settings they have already. So crash auto recovery, you can leave that on or off. Um, external views, leave it on or off. F10 view options, this is generally where you're going to set, uh, I recommend setting this the way you want it to be unless you want the player to be able to see what the, uh, what's on the map. But in a multiplayer situation, generally best to keep it fair by uh, enforcing the F10 view. You can set it to allies only. If you're testing the mission, you can set it to all, or if you want everybody to just be able to see where the enemy is, you can set it to all. You can also set it to fog of war. What this is going to do is if there's a friendly AI nearby that can see uh, an enemy unit, then it'll show up on the map. Otherwise, that enemy unit will not be visible. You set it to my AC, that shows your helicopter only. Nothing else is visible on the map. And if you set it to map only, then the map just has no markers, no your helicopter's not even visible on it. So we're testing the mission, we're going to set it to all. A black shark den. Uh, we like to make sure that everything is, uh, or almost everything is set to override here. So, let's see here. So this is the default settings that we have at Black Shark Den. We have the padlock turned on for anybody who uses it or needs to use it. We've got wake turbulence turned on, GFX or simulation, F10 map marks are available and um, visible. Tra traffic, usually have it off or low. Um, we can set it to low if we want today. Birds, usually 0%. But if you want a whole bunch of birds, you can also increase it as well. And uh, definitely make sure you turn the battle damage assessment off and the cockroach status bar off. As well, make sure your flight modes, more cheats are all turned off in these, uh, these settings up here. Now, this is how you would set it up for a normal mission. But because we're testing this mission out and I'm going to be flying with a controller personally, I'm going to turn my game flight mode on and um, I'll leave the others off. If I get shot down, then oh, well, that sucks. Um, but you can turn the mortality on if you want to be taking on a whole bunch of enemies without worrying about getting blown up. Um, you can set your unlimited fuel on, unlimited weapons. Uh, it's also really, really handy for testing out missions for... Uh, Actually, you know, I'm going to turn that on as well because I don't want to run out of ammo while I'm doing this. Just because I'm doing it by myself. Um, actually, no, you're right. This is a single mission. We'll uh, we'll leave that off. And those are our mission options. So our missions op options are set for testing, specifically. All right. So we've got everything set up for this mission. I'm going to go ahead and save it. I'm going to call it 
Workshop mission one. And we're gonna go fly it. So we're gonna hit the fly mission. We've got our situation here, friendlies on patrol, blah blah blah, take a Huey. Got our picture that we slopped in there. And we'll hit start. So now I've got a couple options I can pick from here. But uh, the, it's a player helicopter, so I'm going to pick LA1. Okay, we're going to go flying. So just double check that your scripts are loaded. Open your radio menu. Um, sometimes you have to hit it a few times for CTLD to load. Go to other, CTLD, make sure everything is there. As long as it's good there, that means you're good to go with CTLD and CSAR. So I'm going to lift off from my pad here. Bear with me, I am flying with a uh, Nintendo controller, or Nintendo style controller. So it looks like I'm going to be crossing a river and then flying over another river. If you've got quite a long flight time and you want to test your mission out, it might be wise to move the helicopter up a bit towards your testing area. Um, as well, you can hit Control Z, which is going to speed up your helicopter. If I hit Shift Z, then it returns back to normal speed. Try not to maneuver while you're in spe time speed up. Uh, you're probably just gonna be wonky all over the place. Not really uh, flying in any sort of organized manner. So I'm gonna fence in here. Then to return fire. thing to remember when you're testing out your mission is what's the player going to feel? I know where this river is because, well, we made this mission, but the player might not understand. Um, so you want to make sure that it's, while you're flying through here, everything is easily identifiable. You, know, you can see that the river is down there. Uh, it's clearly in this valley that we're going to be following. A bit of an easy path for the, the player to follow along here. You don't want it to be such a long flight that it's going to bore the crap out of the player. You don't want it to be a short flight that they're going to be finished the mission in such a short time that they're wanting more. So you want it to have like a good amount of a flight time for a mission. Uh, you can always add a little bit of suspense to the mission by adding a small amount of enemies here and there. That'll keep the player on their toes. head out, eyes on a swivel, you know, watching out for the next possible engagement because they don't know what's out there. They weren't expecting there to be an enemy out there, but there it was, shooting at them, so that's a good uh, good way to add suspense to the flight out. I'm getting a pretty good feel for the way that this mission is going to be flown. It's a pretty simple route to get out there. Just follow along with this river. You hit a fork. Head to the north. The fork is pretty easy to come across here. It's it's really hard to miss. Following the river and the, there's a river on both sides of it. So 
just gonna head north, continuing on course to our target area. Okay, so I'm approaching my combat area and I've got the red smoke on my target. some of these targets down here. Invasive. Or I could just have my mass bump in and crash without a failure. Okay. So this is a good reason why you want to set invulnerability on. Um, because sometimes, especially if you're flying with a controller, you can make stupid mistakes like that and crash into the ground. Let's uh, let's speed things up a little bit this time around. So we're gonna set our immortality on, and get unlimited weapons on as well. I'm gonna place my Huey down. Actually, this is a much easier way to do it. If I place the Huey down, then I gotta set up everything that I did before. So instead, I'm gonna grab my helicopter from before. I'm gonna copy it with Control C. I'm going to move much closer to the AO, place it on the ground. I'm going to set it to tur turning point so it's above the ground. We'll say it's heading at 100 knots uh, with an altitude of 300 feet AGL. If I add a waypoint to it, then I can point which direction the helicopter is moving in. And it'll be a whole It'll put us on course when we load in here. So I like to name my test helicopters Dev Huey. And we'll jump right back in. So I could start out with the helicopter on the pad, or I could pick the Dev Huey helicopter. Just get ready to fly as soon as I hit that fly button. And we're off. Fence in here. We go set it up. Free fire this time. Target. Slow down for an approach to my landing zone here. Time skip it so they come a little faster. Alright, everyone's on board. Now let's get the heck out of here. Speed over altitude departure. Because we are a bit heavy. Should be leaving our area right away, and our mission end trigger should be going off soon. I see what I mean now. We are definitely out of the area, so something went wrong here. Alright, we're gonna back out, and we're gonna do some troubleshooting. So. All of Coalition needed to be out of zone for that trigger to work. Well, we had eight. Blue. All of Coalition out of zone. Blue. Friendlies. Can't 
say I'm sure what happened there. Oh ho. Ha ha ha. See, this is where this is where we had our issue. So I set the unit alive for my my helicopter. Um I didn't add the the additional helicopter. The the testing one. So I'm just gonna get rid of that trigger. And we're gonna test this one again. And this is basically how mission designing goes. It's just running it, testing it, find out a problem, fix the problem, run it again. Speed up time a little bit this time around. summarizes the uh, the testing part of our mission gave it a good look made sure that everything works on it yeah uh, whenever we ran into a problem instead of restarting the mission from the very beginning and trying to do it all over again I instead uh, put a helicopter up a little bit closer to my starting point and uh, I started a little bit earlier there or closer to the starting point. And this is completely fine if you're doing mission testing. Um, it's completely okay to turn on a bunch of cheats for yourself if you need, to uh, place forward helicopters, all sorts of stuff, because you're just testing a mission. You're not here to work on your flying skills. You're, you know, just, you just want to make sure that you can, uh, that your mission works. Everything is going to be great and how you want it to be. Um, especially with those triggers. Uh, even then, you saw there, I, uh, I've made probably darn near 70 to 80 missions so far. And uh, still making silly mistakes like the, uh, like forgetting about the the additional helicopter in that trigger. As you're learning the mission editor, you're probably going to be running across little issues like that. And that's okay. It's all in the learning experience. Oh jeez. Um, <laughs> it's all in the learning experience as you do things more often and learn how different triggers and such work, then um, you'll be more equipped when you're making the next mission. You'll know what little quirks are occurring, why something isn't working the way that you want it to work. Um, where things may be, you get different ideas, all sorts of stuff. It just comes from time and practice of making missions. And um, Black Shark Den, we want to encourage mission, uh, mission design. So, I want you to uh, host these missions, you know, something, just just what I did here, this, uh, this one helicopter mission, extracting troops from a hot area, getting them back to base, and that was it. That's a good mission to run in a multiplayer scenario. Add a couple more bad guys, add some more helicopters, make up a little briefing, and it's ready to go at BSD. Um, that would be a fun little mission to run for about an hour or two, get a bunch of guys out, we'll head out, give the bad guys some hell, get the friendlies out of there, and uh, it'll be fun. Uh, even something as small and simple as this mission that I just put up here is, is a fun mission to run in a multiplayer scenario, such as Black Shark Den. So give it a try. Um, 
We're gonna head back to the mission editor now. We'll uh, we'll look at a few things with regards to uh, some final stuff that you need to do. So we've got the dev helicopter here. We gotta get rid of that. Um, I wanted that uh, that unit to be in zone, so I'm gonna add it back again. Um, or sorry, units alive. So I add that trigger back. I'm going to go to my uh, mission options. I'm going to set the settings to allies only. Turn off my cheats. And then I'm going to set my view. So when you save a mission, um, wherever your camera is, it also saves there. So if you're zoomed all the way in here on the enemy position, um, when people load into that mission and they open the map, this is what they're going to see. It's just really zoomed into the town. So right about when I'm about to save and publish a mission, I like to zoom out to the entire area. So I've got my starting point, I've got my combat area, and I've got the route between it all visible. Then I'm going to hit save, and my mission is done. Ready to go. Ready to be put on the server and get flown by a bunch of people and have a great time. That pretty much summarizes my introduction to the mission editor workshop. There's plenty of other things that you can work, use uh, or do here in the mission editor. Lots of different options for ground units, um, ships, helicopters, different triggers that you can use. Uh, as you see, there's a whole ton of different actions that can be done with the triggers. There's a whole bunch of different conditions that can be checked. Um, we've got different types of triggers such as repetitive ones which once a condition is met will be repeated every second I believe. Uh, we have switched ones which means it'll trigger every time a condition is met and I believe mission start is the same as once but uh, it starts before the timer starts ticking down. Um, I believe it's yeah it's it works a little bit differently. Uh, I hardly use it. I always, always use the once triggers personally. Um, stuff with templates so say you've got uh, you want to place groups down or save a group that's already in position say this hawk battery you can use templates for that and uh, yeah lots of other things you can look at there's a mission editors handbook in DCS that you can use um, goes over a whole bunch of stuff like this talks about different conditions triggers uh, that you can use. Just search up the DCS Mission Editor's Handbook. I believe it's both on the website and in your uh, in your installation documents. And uh, check out what's there as well for some further reading. That summarizes the workshop. Uh, I thank you all for watching this. Uh, I hope that you learned something and that you're more confident in making some missions. Have a great one. See you all later.